right, we're going to get started for today's colloquia. It's my pleasure to introduce Buddy Martin, um, who is a project scientist for the Muir Polishing Lab at the University of Arizona's Richard F. Karras Muir Lab. He leads the fabrication and testing of large optics, including the 8.4 meter segments of the Giant Magellan Telescope. Uh, Buddy's background as a radio astronomer before joining the Mirror Lab in 1986 helps maintain a passion for contributing to new telescopes and new discoveries. Today he's going to be talking about making mirrors for giant telescopes. Thanks, John. Thank you all for inviting me here. It's a little bit ironic that I come over to OSC to talk, tell you about making mirrors because so much of the technology we use was developed here at OSC over many years and still to this day we get a great deal of support from Dayuk and uh, Chang Jin, Andrew, Greg. Really, we really depend on the, the development that's occurred here. And I'll try to remember to give a few shout outs along the way. If I don't, it's just because of a uh, lapse of memory, not because we don't uh, value and appreciate the contributions. Well, we're going to start by going back in time, 100 years to be exact. Edwin Hubble had just been, uh, just been hired by George Hale uh, to be an astronomer at the Mount Wilson Observatory, where the 100-inch telescope had been commissioned just two years before becoming the world's largest telescope, eclipsing the 60-inch telescope also at Mount, Wil at Mount Wilson. One of Hubble's first projects was to photograph stars in what were called spiral nebulae, uh, generally thought to be clouds of stars or gas or both in the Milky Way. Now there was already a debate going on in 1919 about the nature of these spiral nebulae, whether they might be extragalactic. But to most astronomers at the time, our Milky Way was the entire universe. There was nothing outside it. But the 100-inch telescope could identify individual stars in the nebulae much better than the earlier smaller telescopes. And in 1923, Hubble identified the first Cepheid variable star in the Andromeda Nebula, marked here as variable. Uh, there had recently been uh, discovered a relationship between the period of variation of the star and its intrinsic luminosity. So Hubble was able to measure the variation, as shown here, and use that relation to establish the distance to this star, and therefore to Andromeda, as 900,000 light years which put it way outside the Milky Way, which has a diameter of about 100,000 light years, and makes Andromeda comparable in size. It's a similar stellar system to the Milky Way galaxy. So this discovery immediately expanded the size of the known universe by a factor of 10 in distance. Within a few years, with more data from the 100 inch, Hubble would make it a factor of 60. And by 1931, including not only uh, variable stars, but other indicators of distance, it had increased it by a factor of 1,300 in distance, or 2 billion in volume. So this is pretty extraordinary, and it's not even what Hubble was famous, is famous for. What else is going on in 1919? Einstein had introduced the uh, field equations of general relativity in 1915. By 1917, he had applied them to the universe as a whole and realized that he needed another term in order to counteract gravity and allow for a static universe. That term's the cosmological constant. But by 1929, Hubble was able to combine his distances with redshifts measured by Vesto Slipher at Lowell Observatory in Arizona and by Milton Humison at Mount Wilson to show a linear relationship between recession speed and distance, which means the universe is expanding. So not only is the universe dynamic, but you can extrapolate back to find the birthday of the universe, the Big Bang. Hubble's data put it two billion years ago uh, like all astronomers in the 1920s, Hubble had uh, the distance scale incorrect by a factor of seven. So the universe is really seven times larger than he thought, and therefore seven times older. But the linear relationship between speed and distance was correct and revolutionary. 
1931, Einstein abandoned the cosmological constant, later calling it his biggest blunder, or at least that's how the story goes. Nobody knows whether he really said that. Um, and uh, in any case, the, uh, the cosmological constant was no longer needed for, uh, in an expanding universe. Sorry, a question, yeah. This feel too much. Why were all the distance scales off by seven, uh, a factor of seven? It, it, it was partly uh, the relation for Cepheid variable stars. It was partly uh, related to extinction of the light uh, from distant objects. Uh, there were a number of causes that added up in the same direction. It wasn't resolved until much later, 1950s or so, uh, that we got our current distance scale, I think. Yeah. Um, so Hubble's, Hubble's discoveries were revolutionary. Uh, and this is an example of what can happen when you build an instrument that can detect and measure things that could never be measured before. And in astronomy, the new instrument that can do that is generally going to be a telescope. It's true that uh, there are other technological developments that improve sensitivity and angular resolution. Uh, modern CCDs are 100 times more sensitive than Hubble's photographic plates. We now have adaptive optics giving space-like angular resolution at infrared wavelengths and gradually moving down to visible wavelengths. But at some point, the only way to improve sensitivity or resolution, or both, is to have a bigger, bigger telescope. The, uh, the Hooker 100-inch telescope was more or less the middle of a period of unprecedented growth in the size and sensitivity of telescopes. Much of that growth was led by George Hale at Mount Wilson and then with preparations for the 200-inch telescope at Palomar. Each of these reflectors required a bigger glass mirror that than had ever been made. And this was the biggest technical challenge for the 100-inch telescope and the 200-inch telescope. And I believe it's also the biggest technical challenge for the new telescopes that are being built today. There were major problems with a 100-inch mirror. There were four castings. Two of them broke. Two of them were seriously compromised. George Ritchie was the preeminent mirror maker of that time, and he was stuck with the task of polishing a mirror that was full of bubbles because of the multi-layer casting that was the only way to make a disk as large as 100 inch. And he claimed that the mirror was a failure throughout the entire project right up until first light when it was shown that it in fact produced, produced uh, great images. Well, looking ahead to a 200 inch telescope, 200 inch mirror, it was understood that a solid disk of plate glass like the 100-inch mirror wouldn't work. It wouldn't be able to hold its shape due to its weight and its thermal inertia. Uh, there were initial uh, attempts to make a mirror out of very low expansion fused quartz. They failed. They only reached a, a diameter of about uh, 60 centimeters. Couldn't go any farther than that. So Hale and John Anderson changed the design to make a lightweighted mirror out of Corning's new borosilicate glass, low expansion Pyrex. <clears throat> this shows uh, the process in a Popular Science article at the time where the glass is melted in a very high temperature gas furnace and then carried in ladles to the electric furnace where it's poured into the mold. Um, to form the lightweighted structure and then cooled and annealed with good temperature control using the electric furnace. Well, the first casting failed because some parts of the mold broke loose, floated to the top. But the second one, a few months later, succeeded and uh, became the most advanced mirror ever made. It was had lower thermal expansion, was lightweighted by more than a factor of two with the open back and and pockets. At uh, f3.3, it was also faster than the earlier telescope, uh, the earlier mirrors, which made the telescope and the enclosure more compact, but also made it more challenging to polish. The mirror spent 11 years in the Caltech optical shop. Now, admittedly, almost half of that was during World War II, and there was little or no activity um, <coughs> going on with it. 
But even after it, install, it was installed in the telescope, there was touch-up figuring for the first two years in the telescope. <clears throat> the 200-inch telescope remained the world's most powerful for 44 years, which is extraordinary for a major field of science that one, uh, one instrument was the most powerful, at least by some, some measures. And the main reason, by far, is that no one knew how to make a, a larger mirror than this that would hold its shape to the order of 100 nanometers and form sharp images like the 200 inch could. Five meters was the limit. It, it, the, the five meter mirror had hit a limit for control of shape under changing gravity and changing temperature. Now there was a larger mirror in the Soviet BTA-6 uh, uh, six meter telescope, but it failed on both of these counts, uh, counter, or resisting gravity and, and temperature because it, uh, it, it, just, it was a big solid disk of glass. And it wasn't until 1993 that the, tech, the Keck telescopes finally broke, broke through the five meter barrier with segmented mirrors. The segmented mirror technology was one of three technologies to emerge in the 1980s, which led to the current generation of eight to 12 meter telescopes and uh, form core technology for the next generation of 25 to 40 meter telescopes. <clears throat> So um, Jerry Nelson and colleagues at University of California and Caltech had the bold idea that they could make a continuous 10 meter surface out of 36 1.8 meter segments that were held together by uh, positioning actuators, uh, electronic displacement sensors between the segments and occasional wavefront sensors to uh, calibrate the phasing. They were able to use Schott's zero-dur glass ceramic with zero thermal expansion that had become available in 1975. And these, uh, the segments were uh, small enough at 75 centimeters thick that they hardly distort underweight and have uh, fairly low thermal inertia. So this concept has worked wonderfully in the two Keck telescopes. It's been used for three more 10 meter telescopes and it forms the heart of two of the three extremely large telescope projects going forward. The 30 meter telescope with about 500 one meter segments and the European Southern Observatory's extremely large telescope ELT 39 meters with about 700 segments. About the same time that uh, Keck, uh, Nelson was developing the segmented mirror, Ray Wilson and colleagues at the European Southern Observatory decided that they could give up the stiffness of a traditional mirror and replace it with active control of the shape of a flexible mirror, a uh, concept known as active optics. So it required precise force actuators, about 150 supporting an eight meter mirror, continuous wavefront measurements, this reduced the mass and thermal inertia somewhat with a 175 millimeter uh, thick mirror. And uh, they were also able to use zero dur glass ceramic or ULE glass from Corning with zero thermal expansion because those materials could be used to make a, a solid disc like these. Um, so these mirrors are in the uh, ESO's four telescope VLT system, the two Gemini telescopes, and the Subaru telescope, all about eight meters. Also going forward, uh, used for the 3.4 meter secondary for a large synoptic survey telescope, and the four meter secondary and tertiary mirrors for ESO's ELT. And active optics is valuable, has turned out to be valuable, if not essential, for all the large telescopes, even the ones that use uh, much stiffer mirrors like the ones I'll describe next. The honeycomb mirrors developed by Roger Angel and colleagues here at the U of A. Uh, the idea is to maintain the stiffness of tradi traditional mirrors with a small fraction of the weight. Uh, you can think of it as extending the 200 inch technology to eight meters with more extreme light weight weighting. The key technology is the spin casting with a honeycomb mold that fills 80% of the volume, leaving only 20% of glass. Um, we use borosilicate, 
which is the best material that can be cast into a complex structure like this. And with the lightweight honeycomb structure, um, it also achieves a very short thermal time constant, rapid thermal response, because of the thin glass sections and ventilation in the mirror. And that keeps the mirror very nearly isothermal at all times and very close to the changing ambient temperature at all times to minimize um, the air turbulence and wavefront distortion that comes from a, warm, a mirror that's warmer than the surrounding air. It was used in uh, MMT and Magellan six and a half meter telescopes, the two large binocular telescope primary mirrors, 8.4 meters, LSST primary tertiary mirror. The six and a half meter projects allowed the, it strengthened a relationship between the U of A and the Smithsonian Institution and the Carnegie Observatories. And all three of those institutions went on to become founding partners of the giant Magellan Telescope, the 25 meter ELT, which is based on the large honeycomb mirrors. So these, uh, being the sole source of large light weighted mirrors in the world now, um, has made it easy, natural for the U of A to be a partner in uh, the giant Magellan Telescope and uh, to keep U of A at, at the forefront of observational astronomy. <clears throat> the an early development was by Roger Angel, John Hill, and others who started around 1980 to experiment with melting glass into uh, molds for light weighting. And they really did this in a fast and furious mode. It, it's amazing how many wildly different ideas they tried out in the first couple of years. This, these uh, figures are all from one 1982 SPIE paper. Shows four different methods of getting the lightweight structure. Three of them right side up, one upside down, which at the time, at least briefly, was the favored option as indicated by this sketch of an eight meter furnace to be made in the future. But they had also cast a 60 centimeter mirror using the same basic principles that carried through to today. Um, and within a year, they'd cast two 1.8 meter mirrors with essentially the same mold and the same internal dimensions of the mirror as what we're doing today and had made the decision that the winner is option C, the spinning version of this. And that, that's what would be used to build up toward eight meter mirrors in the future. Yeah. For example, A and C minus the spinning. I yeah, know, yeah they're, they're, identi they're identical other than the spinning. A and C are the same other than the spinning. So A was used for these two 1.8 meter mirrors, and C was used for the next spin casting, or the next casting. Roger saw a short focal length is a huge advantage for 8 meter telescopes because it would keep the telescope short and stiff and make the enclosure smaller and relatively inexpensive. And so that leads naturally to using a rotating furnace to create the deep curve of a fast mirror. So the first spin casting was in 1985, a 1.8 meter F1 mirror that went on to be the primary for the Lennon telescope uh, on Mount Graham. Made in this rotating two meter furnace, which at 16 RPM gave the parabolic uh, <coughs> curve for an F1 mirror. Um, when this is scaled up to the LBT's 8.4 meter F1.1 mirrors, spinning saves 28, 28 tons of expensive glass, which is more than the mass of the finished mirror, and uh, greatly reduces the time for grinding out all that glass as well as for annealing it. So it's a great advantage. Well, Roger and Peter Stripmatter and others convinced the University of Arizona and the NSF that this was gonna work at the eight meter size. Uh, so the mirror lab was built in the period 1984 to 86, along with a 12 meter turntable sized immediately for the eight meter mirrors. Here's the foundation for the turntable uh, being, being uh, 
put in the ground out in the open there because there was no mirror lab around it. Uh, the bearing for the turntable. And here it's fully assembled with the, um, the yeah, the, the eight meter turntable. And now it's got a mirror lab around it. Um, initially, the, the furnace was initially about four meters in diameter, or in that, that's the internal diameter. The first casting was a puny 48 inch telescope uh, <coughs> mirror for Smithsonian in 1987. But it was followed by three three and a half meter mirrors in 88 and 89. And then in 1990, the furnace was expanded to uh, the current eight meter size. The, a polishing lab was added with a 24 meter test tower. We transferred the large optical generator from the OSC shop to the mirror lab to become the first uh, fabrication machine here. And uh, cast the first six and a half meter mirrors for MMT and uh, Magellan in 1992 to 94. Moving on, first 8.4 meter mirror for the large binocular telescope in 1997. We installed a, a, a second machine, a 8.4 meter polishing machine in 2003 and used it to polish all the large mirrors starting with the second LBT mirror. Cast the first GMT off-axis segment in 2005. Uh, the LSST primary tertiary mirror in 2009, and that's a unique design with two mirrors on one substrate, the uh, primary on the outer part, tertiary in the inner part. Four more GMT segments between 2012 and 2017, in addition to a couple of six and a half meter mirrors during that time. Well, before I talk about, uh, <clears throat> talk more about making the mirrors, I wanna show you what they look like in the telescopes, how they fit into the telescope design. Uh, the ar large binocular telescope is basically two 8.4 meter telescopes on a common mount, so they're pointing and tracking together. Makes it the world's largest telescope with sensitivity equivalent to a 12 meter, almost 12 meter telescope. And with a coherent beam combiner in place, it ena uh, that enables diffraction limited resolution um, of lambda by 22, equivalent to a 22 meter telescope in one dimension. Now, in order to combine the light coherently, first you have to have uh, excellent adaptive optics correction for each, uh, correcting for the atmosphere's uh, wavefront perturbations for each telescope, and that's done with the deformable secondary mirror on each side, uh, each one having 672 actuators. So the GMT is a very different design. It has seven 8.4 meter segments making a single 25 meter telescope, F0.7 primary mirror. So it's one mirror, one focal plane. It's got a symmetric center segment surrounded by six identical off-axis segments. Um, so it's, very, it's completely different from the other two ELTs which have hundreds of small segments. I don't, I'm not here to argue that GMT is the best design, I think they're all going to work. They're all going to do great science, but I want to point out a few of the advantages. Using the largest mirrors that can be made as segments guarantees a smooth wavefront over the largest possible pieces of the aperture, and it minimizes the number of elements that have to be controlled in the telescope. Well, you might think, sure, but they're big, heavy elements, not easy to position. Well, that's one of, the, one of the beauties of the GMT design is that each primary mirror segment is matched with a 1.1 meter segment of the secondary mirror. What you have to control is not the individual elements, but the optical path through each part of the telescope. Make that constant across the 25 meter uh, aperture. So the fine alignment and the phasing can be done with these small lightweight secondary mirror segments. And for diffraction limited imaging, the secondary segments are deformable mirrors like the LBT has. So they're extremely light and agile, perfect for that kind of control. The primary mirror segments have to be kept aligned to about 100 times greater tolerances, around 100, 100 microns. Um, so this, this, this can be done with the secondary segments. And again, only seven of them. Well, here's the GMT site today, uh, construction 
is underway at Las Campanas Observatory, or Las Campanas in Chile. The Carnegie Observatories have uh, operated telescopes there for 50 years, including the twin six and a half meter Magellan telescopes. And this uh, view from above shows the excavation complete for the telescope pier, the enclosure, and the central uh, operations and maintenance building. So it's coming along. In most telescope projects, the uh, mirror fabrication is the pacing item. We're trying to make that not be the case for GMT at the mirror lab. Um, here's the status of the segments. We finished segment one in 2012, and that, uh, that was one of the first parts of the major parts of the project that were funded because it was a, an extremely important technology demonstration. It retired the greatest single technical risk to the whole project, which is the ability to make the off-axis mirrors. Segment two is tentatively finished. We're uh, going through the acceptance tests right now, and we hope that in a few months we'll be able to say that one is done. Segment three um, recently had its optical surface diamond generated, so it's ready for fine grinding and then polishing now. Segment four is the center segment, the one unique one. It was cast uh, in September 2015. The rear surface has been ground and polished. And we've bonded the load spreaders, which are the interface to the support system. Every, every segment has a similar uh, set of load spreaders. Segment five was our most recent casting uh, about uh, 15 months ago. And it's now ready for rear surface pro processing. And we're waiting for the green light to cast segments six and seven with glass in hand. The, uh, for each mirror, the 20 tons of O'Hara E6 low expansion borosilicate has been uh, purchased. And this is the best material that can be cast into a complex structure. Well, I'm, not going to, I'm going to take you through, if this will start, the, um, oh, OK, good. The mold construction and spin casting of a GMT segment. Uh, we'll start with a, a quick overview and then go through it in more detail. Um, <laughs> The first thing, first step is to make a mold, which is the negative of the honeycomb structure. And then glass is piled on top of it. It's enclosed in the furnace, heated to make the glass melt. While it's molten, the furnace spins to give it the right uh, average curvature. Now we'll go through a series of photos that are taken one, one photo per day during the mold construction for GMT segment two. Uh, the mold starts out with a hard tub of silicon carbide cement. We put the uh, floor down first, and then the cylindrical wall around of the tub. It, uh, the structure is like a barrel with staves that are wrapped in steel bands to hold it together. All of these materials will change their dimensions when they go to high temperature. So in order to stabilize the dimension, we'll do a pre-fire um, by uh, assembling the furnace, heating it, test the spinning at this point. And now um, we'll install the ceramic fiber lining of the tub and 1,700 hexagonal boxes of the same ceramic fiber that will form the cavities, the voids, in the honeycomb. Uh, the ceramic fiber is much softer than the glass. It doesn't have any chemical interaction with the glass, so it's easy to remove it from the glass without putting uh, any undue stress at the end of the process. So the mold is now complete. Uh, another preheat to stabilize its dimensions. And now we're ready to install the glass, the 20, roughly 20 tons of O'Hara E6 borosilicate go in place. It comes to us as irregular blo blocks that were broken out of larger pieces. So every block has only pristine surfaces. They melt together with no trace of the individual blocks. So the furnace is now enclosed, heated to 1,200 degrees C, spins. We have cameras in the ceiling so we can watch the glass melt. It 
uh, much more slowly than that. <laughs> it takes about, once it's molten, it takes about four hours to flow down the 12 millimeter gap. With, it has a consistency like cold honey. Now we're looking a, a close up of the edge. We mark the edge of the mold with the height in inches above the ceramic fiber boxes. And we want to finish with a continuous layer about two inches thick of, a, of glass, and that's, that's where the glass stabilizes for this mirror. So that worked. Um, we'll quickly cool it to, uh, until the glass solidifies around 900 degrees C. From that point on, there's no need for the furnace to spin, but it has to cool very slowly and anneal for a three-month period. Uh, during the annealing, the, the atoms are getting locked in place forever, and you have to minimize density variations, therefore minimize temperature gradients, which means you cool it very slowly. It takes three months. Then we can open the furnace, remove the furnace from around the mold, remove the outer parts of the mold, and we'll be left with the honeycomb mirror, one-piece honeycomb mirror. It still has the ceramic fiber boxes inside, and we'll need to lift the mirror and move it to a different station to remove that. It also still uh, is still attached to the floor tiles, the silicon carbide floor tiles. So now we'll go to a different view. We're going to transfer the mirror to a turning ring where it can be brought up into a vertical plane for that uh, clean-out operation. And this takes the better part of a day, so we'll speed it up. The, uh, with uh, compliant adhesive, RTV, we used, to use real, we used to use GE's Our Best Window and Door Sealant for that. Now it's something a little bit more high tech, but it's just an RTV. You use enough of it, you can lift anything. The steel, the steel frame is great for a horizontal support, but it's not stiff enough, enough to change the orientation relative to gravity. The, the frame would bend and put too much stress into the, mat, into the mirror. So we have to attach it to the stiffening ring, and now it can be brought up into a vertical plane. Once it's in the vertical plane, we'll install an enclosure to protect the mirror and contain the ceramic fiber that's washed out. Um, the enclosure has an elevator platform that, so the technicians can uh, get access to the entire back of the mirror. And the, they will first remove the floor tiles, the silicon carbide floor tiles. You can see there are holes in the back plate now to give access to wash out the ceramic fiber with high pressure water. And at the end of this process, we've got a finished honeycomb mirror blank that's 80% lightweight. The washout, uh, it's a, a few weeks. Yeah, I don't know, three weeks, something like that. Jose. will give up their strength. Uh, you know, I don't know whether they would fail. They certainly have plenty of strength at 1,200 degrees C, which is as far as we go. However, they expand by six inches. Each of those bands expands by six inches. So you have to be very careful about taking up that slack and maintaining tension. Yeah. OK. So the spin casting has made a mirror that has all the mechanical and thermal properties we want. Um, but the spinning only gives a best fit, axisymmetric, parabolic shape to about a half millimeter RMS accuracy. And so we'll go through the traditional optical finishing processes, optical fabrication processes, which I think of as, as three, uh, three processes. First, there's generating, which carves off the glass and defines the optical surface to an accuracy of around 20 microns. And that accuracy is, is determined by the tool motions, how accurately you can move the tool. For the GMT segments, that's where we introduce the 13 millimeters of peak to valley aspheric departure for the off-axis segments. Then we move on to the lapping operations, fine grinding and polishing. With, um, the lapping, in the lapping process, you should, you're not controlling the position of a tool, you're controlling the force or pressure that the tool exerts. And you can achieve much more uh, accurate surfaces by using that principle to, to define the removal rate for the glass. 
get to about one micron RMS for fine grinding and, and polishing, about 20 nanometers RMS, and we get the specular surface that's uh, transparent, reflects 4% of visible light. And on small scales, it's smooth enough to meet the tight requirements for small scale structure. You achieve this accuracy partly because you have very high resolution in removal. The removal rate is roughly one nanometer of glass removed for every meter of tool motion across a, a point on the mirror. So it's a part in a billion in that sense. Uh, this will be guided by a null test with an interferometer and with deflectometry that was developed here and we've implemented um, to give uh, additional information. This is what produces the finished mirror. And so you've got to have independent confirmation of the shape of the mirror. So they're in independent measurements that I'll discuss. So, you know, I, I said you have excellent resolution in removal. That's not the same as excellent accuracy in removal. And <clears throat> we, that it's, it's a challenge to obtain the accuracy in removal, and that's because the lapping process processes want to make spherical surfaces, not telescope mirrors. If you rub any two things together that can wear or uh, deform, they tend to come toward a matching surface that has the same curvature everywhere, and that's a sphere. This uh, silicon sphere at the right is, was made to become the definition of the kilogram. Its volume had to be known to extremely high accuracy. It's been called the world's roundest object, um, smooth to about a tenth of a nanometer on small scales, ra overall round to about th 30 nanometers peak to valley. So you might wonder what kind of technology is required to make such a perfect sphere? And the answer is really simple technology using, used by good opticians and good optical sciences, um, exploiting this tendency of two surfaces rubbed together to make spherical surfaces, exploiting passive smoothing, the fact that a stiff tool naturally exerts more pressure on the high spots. You don't even have to know where the high spots are. You just rub and they'll go away because the tool finds them. The alternative to passive smoothing is what we call figuring, which is directed move, removal based on a detailed map of the surface errors, detailed knowledge of the shape of the surface. So relatively easy to make excellent spherical surfaces, but telescope mirrors are not sphere, spheres, and you're always fighting this natural tendency to make spheres. And that's a, especially a challenge for the fast symmetric mirrors that we made and for the off-axis segments for the GMT. Well, there are two general ways to fight that battle. There are options that favor figuring over smoothing. Uh, they include using a small lap where the mismatch in curvature between the tool and the surface only amounts to a few microns and you have nearly uniform removal rate across the tool face. They include using a compliant lap that deforms to match the surface. And we are using that, so those sorts of tools that were developed here by Jim Burge, Dayu Kim, Chang Jin Oh, and uh, they, you know, they've been, been very effective. There are also options that favor smoothing over figuring. Uh, a now classic method is stressed mirror polishing that Jerry Nelson and others developed for the Keck segments, where you bend the mirror so that the desired surface becomes spherical, you polish it, and then let it relax into the aspheric <coughs> shape. Roger Angel turned that idea around by bending the polishing tool as it moves. as it moves, there we go, um, so that it always matches the local curvature. And when you have two mirrors on one piece of glass, like the LSST primary and tertiary shown here, you can use both approaches at the same time. Like in this picture of figuring, using a passive tool to figure 
uh, the primary mirror and the stress slap to smooth the tertiary mirror or vice versa. <clears throat> well, like polishing wants to make spherical mirrors, um, most methods of testing are natural, are also natural for spherical mirrors. Here's a cartoon sketch of the interferometer, which is the bread and butter test for any telescope mirror because it gives you a map of the full surface, high spatial resolution, um, depth or height resolution of around a hundredth of a wave, five to six nanometers. And uh, it's a direct comparison of the, te the illuminating wavefront and the mirror surface. What you measure is actually the difference between the shape of the mirror and the shape of that illuminating um, <clears throat> wavefront. So the illuminating wavefront is an optical template, and it has to match the ideal mirror surface. It's fairly easy to make that template wavefront for a sphere. You just uh, shine a light on a laser on a, or focus it on a pinhole, get an accurate spherical wavefront. But telescope mirrors require a null corrector to shape the wavefront into matching the um, desired mirror surface. You probably know something about the, the story with the Hubble Space Telescope, how the null corrector was assembled in incorrectly, so it made the wrong template wavefront. It had errors which were 40 or 50 times greater than the expected uncertainty in that, in that wavefront. <clears throat> so, we know it, it's, it's essential to understand your null corrector and to have some independent uh, confirmation. The null corrector, the null lens, for the LBT mirrors has some massive lenses. It's taller than me. It's reshaping the wavefront to, uh, by 1.4 millimeters to an accuracy of tens of nanometers. So this null corrector does a lot of work, and it requires independent confirmation. Jim, De Jim Burge developed a method that we used for all the symmetric mirrors when he was uh, on the faculty here. And that's the use of a reflective computer-generated hologram that mimics a perfect mirror. When placed here, where the wavefront is, at, is its narrowest, it sends light back exactly as if it were a perfect mirror. But its design is only based on the mirror prescription, nothing to do with the null end, so it's completely independent. Well, the test for the GMT mirrors is, is nothing like that. It's nothing like anything that's ever been done before for any other mirror. You can't use lenses. Now, Jose Sassian actually did design lenses as a null corrector for this, but there, it was a wicked set of lenses, and I, I think Jose would even agree it wasn't a practical solution for the GMT <coughs> off-axis segments. We wound up using uh, a design by Jim Burge and Chun Yu Zhao at OSC, uh, which uses two spherical mirrors and a computer-generated hologram. The challenge here, of course, is creating this template wavefront that has 13 millimeters of aspheric departure, accurate to 200 nanometers on large scales and five nanometers or so on uh, small scales. The large spherical mirror also serves to fold the test down so that we can fit it into the mirror lab. Um, and in this blow up of the small pack, okay, so the large spherical mirror, 3.8 3 meters diameter, it's a tilted sphere. Uh, and then in this blow up of the smaller package, you can see the second tilted sphere, computer generated hologram, and the interferometer. So let's see how that wavefront shaping works. I find it easier to follow the wavefront backwards on the return path after it reflects off the GMT segment. Um, so at the GMT segment, the wavefront matches the shape of the mirror with 13 millimeters of um, <coughs> deviation from a sphere. After the reflection off the first tilted sphere at this region, that uh, aspheric departure is cut in half to six millimeters. After the second reflection off the smaller tilted sphere, it's almost eliminated down to 320 microns um, with the low order errors gone. 
And now we're within range of correction with the CGH. You can design a CGH to, to change the wavefront in any way with limitation. It's limited only by the size, the physical size, and the maximum slope change. And we're within those limits at this point. So you design the CGH and make it to eliminate the remaining aberration and return a spherical wavefront to the interferometer. <clears throat> Well, this interferometric test that I showed you has it all gives us all the information we need to make the mirror and qualify the mirror. It has all the accuracy we need, at least according to our analysis on paper. But nobody's willing to bet hundreds of millions of dollars that we didn't make a Hubble-like mistake somewhere in the design or assembly or measurement of that null corrector. So it's it's, it's essential to have an independent test. The interferometric test is it's difficult to put together in a line because it's not natural for a telescope mirror. It's natural for a sphere. But we've got an independent test, uh, which all, Jim Burge also developed for us, that's completely independent and is natural for a telescope mirror. The defining property of the telescope is to focus collimated light to a point. Um, well, we can't illuminate the whole mirror with starlight in the mirror lab and achieve that, but we can synthesize that collimated wavefront with a 40 millimeter patch that scans over the surface with this scanning pentaprism system. The pentaprism keeps the light parallel within one microradian as it scans us across. If everything's perfect, that light comes to a point here which does not move as you scan because every point on the telescope, every part of the telescope is focusing the light right here. If there are slope errors on the mirror, and there are, then the spot will move as we scan across. And we measure that motion with a camera, which is located at a point that corresponds to the telescope's focal plane. It's, and is also accessible in our test tower so we can install a camera there to measure that, uh, uh, that spot motion. And with a combination of five sc or scans across five different diameters of the mirror, we can measure the first eight, order, uh, eight low order aberrations or Zernike polynomials to about the same accuracy that we get with the interferometric test. And that includes a measurement of radius of curvature, which we have to get right because all seven segments have to match in radius of curvature. <clears throat> so this agreement guarantees that the figure error in the mirror is small enough that it can be corrected essentially perfectly in the telescope using active optics. In other words, the wavefront accuracy would be limited only by the wavefront measurements at the telescope, not by any properties of the mirror. We also have the information on small scale structure from the interferometer and an independent deflectometry system. And with agreement of all of these tests, we know the mirror is going to make exquisite images in the telescope, and the telescope project will accept it. Well, with the mirror now accepted, um, it's a good time to step back and uh, think about what, what, what this is all about. Why do we do this? Well, it's all about understanding nature on a scale vastly bigger than any of our direct experiences. And the GMT is going to teach us about the universe, so many aspects of the universe. I can't possibly do it justice in the conclusion of this talk. I'll just pick out one. Uh, one example, it's a hot topic in astronomy, and especially in astronomy with the next generation of, of telescopes. And fortunately, I came across this uh, <clears throat> treatment, which is everything you always wanted to know about, EL, about exoplanets with ELTs in one slide, made by Katie Morzinski at Stewart Observatory. It's a little too much for me to take in, so I'll break it up. <clears throat> Starting with the indirect detection of a planet tells us tells us there's a planet out there, an exoplanet out there, um, and in this case, it's done by measuring the periodic Doppler shift of the star as it orbits around the 
center of mass that it shares with the planet. Uh, has an amplitude of five kilometers per second. That's walking speed. Uh, in a period of 11 days, really short compared to our 365 five days. Well, this is thought to be a rocky planet, similar in size uh, to the Earth, but it's, it's on a very small, rapid orbit around a small star. So if you want to find a real Earth-like planet, you've got to be able to go to much, uh, you've got to be able to measure much smaller speeds. Sun's motion caused by the Earth is more than 10 times slower than this. It's not walking speed, it's crawling speed. And believe it or not, this is a goal for the GMT and the other ELTs. This, there's no guarantee it'll be achieved, but with the, ex, the additional sensitivity and a new generation spectrographs, there's a hope that we can measure that speed of motion in stars many light years away. <clears throat> but that's not the, the real advantage of the <clears throat> ELTs is not in the indirect detection, but it's in the direct imaging and spectroscopy <clears throat> that we hope to do for exoplanets. And the challenge here, the challenge in direct imaging, is that the planet is next to a star that's around 10 million times brighter, and for nearby stars, only separated by about 100 nanoradians. To be able to separate the planet from the star requires GMT's diffraction limited resolution of around 40, of 40 nanoradians at a wavelength of one micron. It requires exquisite wavefront correction uh, for the atmosphere and all other imperfections, such as we hope to get with the two-stage two extreme adaptive optic system that Jared Mayles and colleagues are developing here at Stewart, uh, it also requires a coronagraph to block the starlight. And that, we hope, will allow us to obtain images of these planets. <clears throat> but a point-like Im point -like image of an exoplanet is not the Holy Grail. The Holy Grail is a spectrum of the reflected light that it contains absorption lines from the planet's atmosphere that are signatures of life. So those of, that would be absorption lines including oxygen and some combination of other molecules that couldn't, that couldn't persist in equilibrium without continuous input from uh, <clears throat> biological activity. And here, the sensitivity of an extremely large telescope like GMT will greatly increase the range of distances over which we can obtain these spectra and the number of candidates for <clears throat> detection of life. Well, finding life requires a lot of de development of power technology in addition to the big telescopes. It's not going to happen at first light with any ELT. It might not happen in my lifetime. But unless life uh, depends on an extraordinary convergence of extremely unlikely conditions, it'll happen in his. Um, and who knows whether finding life will be the next big discovery on par with uh, Hubble's <clears throat> discovery of the expansion of the universe with a 100-inch telescope 100 years ago. Uh, it might turn out to be something completely unexpected. There's no telling what we'll discover when we double the size of the telescope. Thank you. <clears throat>